Why do we love the end of the world? Since the dawn of mankind, humans have told stories of how mankind will end, what will lead to its downfall, and more importantly, how will the last of the humans survive when the whole world is barren and empty? No matter the cause of the world's end, the story focuses on those who continue to live on after the event, in a world without society, without structure or rule, a broken world that you must strive through and adapt to, as humans do so well. Whether the apocalypse is natural, such as weather or geological disasters, man-made like nuclear fallout or resource depletion, or even something more imaginative like a pandemic, the dead rising, rogue technology, aliens, or something else. Each story follows the theme of the apocalypse and the life that remains after. Post-apocalyptic video games aren't a specific genre of game, it's more of a setting and atmospheric element that lends to the games. However, since video games were created, the setting has appeared and it's been something that people continue to create their games around, and it's sort of become its own category and subgenre of game. The list of games is in the hundreds, so there's no way to cover every title out there, but there are icons in the history that led to the development of some of the most iconic games and franchises that are out there right now. So today, let's discuss a brief history of post-apocalyptic video games. Video games are a very recent media when it comes to human history, but like I said earlier, stories of the end of the world have been around since the world began. Christianity had the Book of Revelation, Islam had the Day of Judgment, Norse mythology had Ragnarok, even earlier than those stories is the Epic of Gilgamesh from 2000 BC which told tales of a great flood from the ancient gods to wash away the world that we knew. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest known piece of literature in existence, so the oldest story that we have today as humans is a story about how the world ends. Stories of not just the apocalypse, but the life after it became popularized after the 1826 novel The Last Man by Mary Shelley, the same Mary Shelley that wrote Frankenstein. The Last Man follows a group of people struggling to survive in a plague-infected world. These people eventually perish until there is only The Last Man. Shelley took inspiration from an 1805 poem titled Le Demir Homme, or in English, The Last Man, by a French poet named Jean-Baptiste Cousin de Grainville. This is the first modern post-apocalypse story. Other great authors touched on the topic as well and developed the concept further. The Conversation of Eros and Charmon by Edgar Allan Poe tells the tale of Earth being struck by a comet and depleting the atmosphere of nitrogen, leaving only oxygen resulting in a global inferno. Poe tells this story as a conversation between these two souls in the afterlife. H.G. Wells explored the genre with both the time machine and the world of worlds, telling a story of a time traveler traveling forward to the Earth's demise to the sun becoming larger and larger, and a story of Mars's invasion of Earth, respectively. Life often imitates art, and though these stories were always fiction and exploration of the human psyche, when the world went through World War II, the end of times was something more than fiction. The presence of nuclear attack entered the public consciousness, and the idea of life after the apocalypse gained widespread popularity. Year after year, literature, TV, film, comics, music, art, tabletop games, all consumable media available to the world depicted countless variations on post-apocalypse life, evolving it into what we know it as today. The popularity of the growing topic overlaps seamlessly with the origin of video games and another form of storytelling took the reins to tell a tale of an ending world. The earliest example of a video game using a post-apocalypse setting is a top-down shoot-'em-up game developed by VidKids called Robotron 2084. It was released as an arcade game in 1982 and then on the Apple II and Atari 8-bit the following year. You play as an unnamed superhuman trying to save what's left of the human race after robots have taken control of the world. Another game using a simple B-movie style plot is Ant Attack in 1983. Developed by Sandy White for the ZX Spectrum, this game puts the players in a city overrun by, well, you guessed it, giant ants. This game is regarded as the first true isometric game as well as one of the first games to allow you to choose your gender. Another game came out the following year in 1984 developed by the same person, Sandy White, with a very similar premise as well, just sub out the giant ants for the undead and you get Zombie Zombie, also on the ZX Spectrum. In 1986, a game called Trinity developed by Infocom was released. This game isn't a post-apocalyptic game, but its themes are heavily inspired by the same nuclear paranoia 
Victoria stirred up by World War II. It's a text-based game where the player travels through time going through different moments in history including 1949 Siberia where Russia tested their first nuclear bomb, 1945 Nagasaki where the US dropped nuclear bombs on Japan, and a few months earlier in 1945 in the deserts of New Mexico. The player is put in the first ever location where humans dropped a nuclear bomb labeled Trinity by the US military, and it changed human history forever and the nature of war in the atomic era. Not the most pleasant game to play, but when it comes to post-apocalyptic imagery, nothing quite hits as close to home as bringing up the very real threat of IRL nukes. The most important game in this era of video games was the first true post-apocalyptic game, and it was most certainly Interplay's Wasteland, released in 1988. Video games of the late 80s started to borrow heavily from tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons and Tunnels and Trolls, the latter game being designed by a dude named Ken St. Andre. This dude also led design on Wasteland. Wasteland is the first game to use the apocalypse as a narrative tool. Games before just had a disaster and you just ran around trying to avoid robots, ants, or zombies. Wasteland brought focus to the people dealing with the societal breakdown and scavenging supplies to survive, channeling much of the earlier post-apocalypse literature and movies in history. The main character is a member of the Desert Rangers, a small group of people from the US Army. The world went through a global nuclear war in 1998 and about 100 years later, in 2087, the Desert Rangers run the southwest United States, and they protect the remaining civilizations there while exploring city ruins such as Las Vegas for more survivors and supplies and dispatching threats as they arise. The game was the ideal experience for all those out there that love post-apocalypse fiction as it puts you in this immersive RPG where the world has ended and you just gotta get moving. Wasteland was also one of the first video games to feature a persistent world, meaning that players' changes to the environment would remain after they left that area. This game is the foundation of all post-apocalyptic games to come after, and lord knows there's plenty of games that came after. The next year, in 1989, we got Midwinter, a first-person RPG where the world's covered in snow and ice. 1994 had Final Fantasy VI, which had a mid-game event that ripped the earth in two. 1994 also had Beneath the Steel Sky, where the world has succumbed to nuclear fallout and pollution. Games continue to innovate and expand on this post-apocalyptic trope until 1997 where a game took all the concepts from Wasteland, perfected them, and then added even more to the pot. Love the series or hate it, Fallout is the poster boy franchise when it comes to post-apocalyptic video games. It sparked a new flame in the genre after it was released in 1997. Fallout was developed by Interplay, the same studio that made Wasteland. The studio initially wanted to make a Wasteland sequel, but EA still had the publishing rights to that franchise. That's right, EA has been shitty since the 90s. So instead of a sequel, they just made a spiritual successor, that being Fallout. Fallout set in a timeline that deviated after the end of World War II. Two, the height of nuclear paranoia. Technology, politics, and culture all took different turns than reality. Technology continued to advance, but society and culture as a whole remained the same as the 50s, giving the world a retro-futuristic feeling with a ray gun gothic appearance. The world goes through a petroleum shortage in the 2050s, and soon after, China invades Alaska as tensions arise. The US goes to war with China, using Canada's resources, quickly causing global involvement, and eventually global nuclear war. Within Within two hours of whoever first hit the red button, most major cities in the world are destroyed. The effects of this war do not fade for hundreds of years as society tries to survive in this barren post-nuclear wasteland. Some people were squirreled away in vaults, these nuclear bunkers built by mega corporations, and they had some pretty varied results. The first Fallout game you play as a vault dweller released into the wasteland in 2161, 84 years after the bombs were first dropped. So many things from Fallout advanced not only the RPG elements of video games, but the post-apocalypse themes as well. The game introduces a karma system that alters how people in different factions interact with you. A special system where you allot points to specific attributes of your characters such as strength, intelligence, charisma, and luck, as well as the use of ability points that you get to use as you level up and gain experience points. These offer more customizable playstyles and features that you can choose from. It did borrow the isometric top-down perspective from Wasteland, but it expanded on most other things that Wasteland brought to the table, such as moving character portraits and dialogue and the ability to recruit team members. Fallout even had some kick-ass voice acting from the great Ron Perlman and David Warner, among others. Fallout started a new era in post-apocalyptic games, and the popularity of the genre started to pick up some steam. The next year in 1998, we got the sequel, Fallout 2. This is
This game expanded on the scope and story of the first game, but stayed pretty consistent in the visuals and gameplay style. You build and customize your character in whatever variety of ways that you choose. You choose your stats, your abilities, perks, and playstyle, and can handle all the tasks given to you in any way you want. And you are placed in a similar environment and pitted against similar enemies and monsters as the first game as well. It didn't innovate too much because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It is on an upgraded engine. The NPCs you can bring into your party are more interactable and can do more things things in the first, such as rush doors that are being blocked, the dialogue system was expanded on, and more pop culture references and jokes were added in, as well as more special encounters, all things that continued to be a mainstay in the Fallout series. Also in 1998, Valve released Half-Life. It's more of a dystopian game, but I feel like it deserves a mention here as it uses a lot of post-apocalyptic themes and innovative gameplay mechanics that are used as inspiration for many titles to come. You play as Gordon Freeman, a scientist who accidentally opens up a portal to another dimension, allowing unknown creatures to invade the Earth. Also, there's zombies. Turn of the Century brought more innovation to the table with Ion Storm's Deus Ex. This title is another that's not specifically post-apocalyptic, but it takes a lot of those themes and combines them with dystopian and cyberpunk themes as well. This game takes place in a world ravaged by a deadly plague and inequality. Fallout Tactics was released in 2001 and took a different playstyle to the wasteland. Instead of turn-based combat, this game played out like a real-time strategy game. It also allowed perks and stats to be customized for the party members instead of just a playable character. Fallout Tactics was a much welcome innovation to the Fallout world, more so than Interplay's 2004 installment, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. It was the first Fallout game for consoles and it differed from the previous titles of the series in almost every way. The gameplay is linear, non-open world, and much more action oriented. It also featured a heavy metal soundtrack composed of Slipknot and Killswitch Engage and a stark contrast to the prior games which had the ink spots and Louis Armstrong. It just wasn't a great game. Half-Life 2 was released in 2004 as well. After the hole to another dimension was ripped open, it attracted a multi-dimensional and superior empire called the Combine to Earth. Still a more dystopian game than post-apocalyptic, but a lot of themes translate and they're still zombies. 2005 had Phantom Dust, a real-time strategy game developed by Microsoft Game Studios. It combined elements of third-person shooters and card games into a distant future Earth where the surface has become uninhabitable due to, well, dust. Man Mankind had to hide underground to survive, but there's also people able to control the dust. The original release of this game saw abysmal sales, but the concept was really interesting. Insomniac Games released Resistance Fall of Man as the PlayStation 3 launch title in 2006. In the game, an alien race invades the Earth and captures civilians, subjecting them to mutations and artificial evolution, creating an army of alien subspecies used to annihilate the human race. It's a first person shooter, but the background and lore are surprisingly deep. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl was released in 2007 by GCS Game World. This game brought first person shooter and survival horror elements into a post apocalyptic setting. While this game isn't based on a world apocalypse, it does take place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, following a second explosion of the nuclear plant. The only environments shown in the game are the zone, and not much more information is given of the outside world, so it's unknown if this is a global event or an isolated incident. Either way, this game exemplifies the post apocalyptic environment and is another mainstay in the genre, inspiring many to come after, including the next big hitter in the timeline, Fallout 3. I decided to have Fallout 3 be the entry to the new generation of post-apocalyptic games. As Fallout 1 in 1997 brought such a significant change to the world of gaming, it started a new era to the world-ending genre, same as Fallout 3 in 2008. Fallout 3 is the first entry to the series developed by Bethesda, after they bought the IP from Interplay. It marks an incredibly major shift in the Fallout series, being a first-person 3D shooter rather than a top-down isometric game. It's still an open world and you still have all the character customization options available to you. And you 
you choose how you wish to play the game. It's still very much an RPG like the first two games. Bethesda, most known for their Elder Scrolls series of games, is no stranger to the RPG genre, and they knocked that element out of the park for Fallout 3. And the mastering of the post-apocalyptic wasteland was just icing on the cake. Fallout 3 is one of my personal favorite games of all time, and it's truly one of the best post-apocalyptic games of all time, if not the best. The world of post-apocalyptic games boomed in 2008 and the following years. Most of these games are the best of the genre, and that's why I deem this generation of games the golden era. Other than Fallout 3, 2008 gave us a second Stalker game with Stalker Clear Sky. It expanded on the universe inside the ravaged Chernobyl exclusion zone, continuing to add innovative mechanics and narratives such as a faction war. Valve also released a new IP called Left 4 Dead, a multiplayer zombie horde game where players are faced against hundreds of zombies in various different levels. The game was renowned for its amazing AI that controlled pacing, item placement, and created a dynamic gameplay adding tremendous replay value. Resistance 2 was also released by Insomniac, expanding the story of the first and increasing the scope of the alien invasion slash artificial human breeding tremendously. The next year in 2009 we got Left 4 Dead 2. Man, remember when Valve made games? This is another immediate follow-up similar to Fallout 1 and 2 where the mantra is if it ain't broke don't fix it. Left 4 Dead 2 follows another group of survivors fighting waves and waves of zombies. It uses the same Valve source engine and it upgraded the AI from the first game for an even more balanced and dynamic gameplay loop. Another interesting title in 2009 came out and perhaps one of the only post-apocalyptic racing games to be released. Fuel, developed by Asobo Studio, takes place on a sun-scorched earth and has an accelerated day-night cycle and natural phenomena like tornadoes and sandstorms. A pretty unique setting for a racing game if you ask me. 2010 was a monster year for post-apocalyptic games. Massive titles and established series like Fallout New Vegas and Stalker Call of Pripyat. New Vegas is a spin-off game of the series taken over by Obsidian Entertainment. It's widely referred to as the best Fallout game. I'm personally a Fallout 3 guy, but the arguments for New Vegas are pretty rock solid. The games are great, Obsidian added a much more story rich narrative, and the ability to solve problems in any way you see fit is a great nod to the earlier games of the series. It plays much like Fallout 3 and not much changes there. Also canonically, it takes place 4 years after the event of Fallout 3. The second massive series installment in 2010 was Stalker Call of Pripyat. The most polished title of the series to date, still taking place in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, graphically enhancing the post-apocalyptic feel and continuing the narrative of all the oddities in the zone. Metro 2033 from 4A Games was also released in 2010, another one of my personal favorite games. This game takes place in Russia after the global nuclear war happens and leaves the surface of the world uninhabitable. And like Phantom Dust, humans are forced underground into the metro tunnels of Moscow to survive. Different stations of people become their own mini civilizations, creating factions and causing conflict of the people, all while the surface is riddled with radiation and mutated monsters. All bad for your health. Developers 4A games are made up from a group of people from GCS Game World, the makers of Stalker games, and Metro 2033 is regarded as a spiritual successor to Stalker. Also from 2010, Darksiders, developed by Vigil Games, is one of the more unique post-apocalypse game franchises. Taking place on Earth, you play as War, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. After a battle between heaven and hell happens on Earth, you are falsely blamed for the apocalypse beginning, and you try to find the true person that's responsible. The next year, 2011, brought us Resistance 3, the conclusion to the alien invasion storyline, as well as id Software's Rage, a first-person shooter taking place a century after the Earth was struck by an asteroid. You play as a soldier waking up from hibernation to find what's left of the world has fallen to an oppressive organization called The Authority. 2012 produced a giant hit to the genre with Telltale's The Walking Dead, based on the hit comic series of the same name. It's based on the same world, but the characters and story that take place are all original to the game. The game is a decision matters episodic adventure game, giving the player tough decisions to make as shit continuously hits the fan, truly capturing the post-apocalypse vibes as well as the comics and TV show did. The same year I Am Alive from Darkworks and Ubisoft Shanghai was released, a survival game based on a ravaged America one year after something called The Event. This caused massive earthquakes nationwide that destroyed cities, leaving the remaining population without resources and scared and agitated. One of the unique aspects of the story is that the government still exists and it tries to help the people, but they simply don't have the power to fix this disaster. Another unique title of the year was Tokyo Jungle, a game where humanity is completely extinct. You play as various different animals in a deserted Tokyo and you try to recruit 
other animals into your pack. You can play as up to 50 different breeds and types of animals, everything from lions to pomeranians. 2012 also had Darksiders 2. This game you play as War's brother, Death, as he tries to find and help clear his brother's name after being accused of starting the apocalypse. Another massive title to the genre came out in 2013, The Last of Us, developed by Naughty Dog. This is a global pandemic post-apocalypse game, not unlike a zombie outbreak. The cause behind the infected is a mutated cordyceps fungus spreading through spores, turning the infected humans into aggressive creatures. One of the best examples of fantastic storytelling mixed with compelling gameplay. You play as Joel, a smuggler in this new fallen world, and you're tasked with smuggling a child, Ellie, out of the setup quarantine zone. It's a beautiful story and it uses the post-apocalyptic world with such care to deliver its narrative. State of Decay was another 2013 title that led new innovation to the genre. Set up in a zombie-infested world, it tested the leadership abilities of the player as it puts you in charge of a community of survivors and it throws continuous problems at you as you try to balance supplies, group morale, base defense, zombie hordes, and people's lives. DayZ and Project Zomboid both released in 2013 as well, both being early access open world zombie survival games each unique in their own way. DayZ focuses on open server multiplayer gameplay where Project Zomboid is focused solely on a single player's length of survival. 2013 also had Metro Last Light, continuing the trials and tribulations of Underground Moscow. As the years continue on, more indie games like Project Zomboid and DayZ continue to be made. Some good and some, well, not. 2014 had one of the better titles with Seven Days to Die, a zombie survival game where you're dropped into a randomly generated world World and tasked with surviving as long as possible versus these zombie hordes. The same year, Brian Fargo, co-producer of the original post-apocalyptic game Wasteland, acquired the rights to the series and made a new installment with his new development studio, In Exile Entertainment, releasing Wasteland 2 in 2014. He recruited a large portion of the original Wasteland team to work on it, including designer Ken St. Andre. It played a lot like the isometric RPGs of the 80s and 90s, but it was up to modern standards with graphics and gameplay. The story also continued the plot of the first game, taking place in 2102, 15 years after the events of the first title. Insomniac Games also released Sunset Overdrive. I guess after Resistance 3, they wanted to continue the post-apocalyptic environment. This game is much more light-hearted than most games of the genre, focusing on momentum-based movement through a city overrun by mutants. My buddy Mare Herbert made a great retrospective video on it recently. The golden era, in my opinion, ended with 2015. This generation had almost all the titles you may think of when asked what your favorite post-apocalyptic video game is. And the last year had some amazing titles to offer. 2015 gave us Fallout 4, a massive undertaking of the series. It expanded on a lot of aspects in the series such as graphics and gameplay mechanics like base building. This title was a true AAA game. Unfortunately, there were some drawbacks from the series as well. The dialogue and overall post-apocalyptic feeling faltered in comparison to prior games of the series. This was a good game by most accounts, but not not the best fallout. One of the most notable 80s post-apocalypse movies got a game interpretation in 2015 as well, with Avalanche Studios' Mad Max. It nailed the post-apocalyptic feel with the world barren of fossil fuels. Everything's now run by raiders and bandits who control the resources in the area. The game emphasized vehicular combat similar to the movies. A new type of zombie game came out this year as well called Dying Light, a first-person parkour-focused game that allows you to survive the zombies and deadly humans alike by running and jumping around a quarantine city. A few notable small titles also released in 2015, Sheltered, a survival game where a family is hiding out in a bunker after nuclear war, battling resource management with food, water, and medication, as well as Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, as a unique title from the Chinese room. It's a walking simulator game where you explore a rural town after all the humans suddenly vanish. Video games keep getting increasingly more popular over the years, and the theme of the post-apocalyptic world continues to interest the vast majority of people. To this date, games are being released on the genre and still innovating on it with new gameplay mechanics, new narratives to follow, and even more clever ways of depicting the end of the world. Tom Clancy's The Division was released in 2016, depicting a pandemic-stricken Manhattan. You're tasked with helping the remaining survivors rebuild, as well as to combat all the criminals taking advantage of the situation. 
situation. The game is a third person shooter with role playing elements and a focus on co-op gameplay. 2017 had a few unique titles of the genre with They Are Billions, a real time strategy game, and a steampunk zombie infested world. The Long Dark puts the player in a frigid Canadian wilderness after a geomagnetic storm. In 2017 as well, Horizon Zero Dawn was released, depicting the most futuristic look at society's decay, taking place in the 31st century where humans live scattered on land in tribes and giant robots dominate the earth. It's so far in the future that most humans don't even know how civilization collapsed. 2018 brought many series installments such as Fallout 76, State of Decay 2, and Darksiders 3, all receiving various levels of praise. A few standouts on innovation of the year were Atom RPG, a game heavily inspired by the original Fallout titles, with deep RPG elements and a top-down perspective with an open world. Frostpunk of the same year brought the city building genre to the table, putting you in charge of caring for your your people after a volcano erupted, causing an uninhabitable winter on Earth. My buddy Sir Hellfire recently made a great video on this game. 2019 was another major year for sequels and series installments. The Division 2, Metro Exodus, and Rage 2 were all released, following the same storyline more or less of the series as a whole. A Far Cry spin-off game called New Dawn was released this year as well, following 2018's Far Cry 5, where the ending of the game had a nuke being set off in Montana. A zombie horde shooter game came out called World War Z, not related to the book or the movie of the same name, but a fun zombie shooter nonetheless. Two titles did stand out this year though, Days Gone, which had a great setting of post-pandemic Oregon, and Remnant from the Ashes, where the world has been thrown into chaos by an ancient evil and monstrous creatures. It had a Dark Souls-like gameplay mixed with third-person shooting. Even this year, in 2020, we're expecting some big titles like The Last of Us 2 and Wasteland 3. I'm sure many new titles are being produced as well, new IPs and new innovations. The world simply loves to tell the story of how everything will end and we as humans love to live vicariously through gameplay on how we would survive in the post-apocalyptic world. It's a big reason why role-playing games are such a strong genre to use the apocalypse as fuel for storytelling. So whether your favorite title is Fallout, Metro, The Last of Us, or anything else, you're not alone in loving the end of the world. Since humans started telling stories, we started telling stories of how the world will end. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you learned something interesting. What's your favorite post-apocalyptic game? And if I fail to list it, explain why you think it deserves a spot in history on the timeline. I hope to see you next time. Peace.